introduce our speaker. Most of us know her, but we've got some background that even I didn't know. Deborah, our speaker today, is a graduate from Oral Roberts University, holds a Master's of Education from Andrews University in Berean Springs, Michigan. From 1981 to 1988, she coordinated evangelistic meetings for Amazing Facts as a Bible worker and singing evangelist. For two years, she worked with a prophecy seminar team assisting in meetings in both French and English for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada. In 1992, Great Lakes Adventist Academy hired her to teach senior Bible and conduct the witnessing and outreach programs where 186 students participated in giving Bible studies to local residents and other students. In 2007, after serving 11 years as an associate in pastoral care, for the Grand Rapids Central Seventh-day Adventist Church in Michigan Conference, she retired with her husband Marty to work briefly for the Bibles for Africa program at Remnant Publications in Coldwater, Michigan, where they have a summer home. Please welcome Sis Sister Deborah to our pulpit this morning. Thank you, Pastor John, for oh, that's me with my quick clip. We're going to have a sermon this morning, uh, a teaching that's going to be about Passover. And that's why we had the children's story that goes kind of like that as well. And um, the, uh, the thing that I want to get across is this miraculous exchange, the wonderful thing that happened when Jesus became our Passover. Amen? Uh, here in Matthew 26, verse 17 through 19, last week we had... We had um, communion here. And I don't know if all of us realize that uh, Jesus was celebrating the Passover, but in Matthew 26, we see that uh, he said, um, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where will you that we prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said to them, go into the city to such a man and say to him, the master said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did what Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And so we call this the Lord's Supper, don't we? Yeah, but the, and they were celebrating the Passover. <coughs> I want to talk today a little bit about that. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And here this artist has given us a picture of what Jesus was trying to get over to his disciples as he talked to them about him being the Passover lamb. Amen? Amen. So in this um, day and age, we have people that um, are, have not accepted Jesus as their Savior yet. And those people that are in the Jewish tradition still celebrate what we call the cedar meal, the Passover meal. They use an egg on the table. They have the unleavened bread, this flat matzo bread. In fact, do you know that as of last night at sundown, the Jewish calendar began the day of Passover? And um, over there, oh, you know what else I forgot to get out? There was grape juice that was drunk at, um, at that time, and this obviously represented the blood of Jesus. But grape juice was drunk to honor the Lord, recognizing his benefits and the goodness that makes everything possible. They had bitter herbs on the plate, we usually shredded horseradish, representing the bitterness that Israel endured before their escape from Egypt. And the shake bone of the Passover lamb brings to mind the deliverance which the Lord God brought for us by the blood of this sacrifice, and it's served on a plate that's reserved for Elijah, because they're still waiting for the Elijah message to come. Over here you had parsley, it's a symbol of springtime. Parsley is placed in salt water, a sign of the tears that need to be shed before joy can be experienced. And then they have mixed fruit called charoset, I'm not positive on that pronunciation, but it's made of apples and walnuts to help us remember the mortar which the Israelites were forced to make when they were slaves in Egypt. And so there you have a, a, a plate that would be prepared for a Passover meal. When you think about it, though, we go back from Jesus' time all the way back to Egypt and the real Passover and how it took place. 
And the first thing that actually came to Pharaoh, the very first, the very first, um, the very first warning that was given is something we're going to discuss here. And right now I'd just like to have a prayer. But for my sake and for yours too. Alright? Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the Bible. Amen. The Word of God which shares all this wonderful information, the, the history of your, your interaction with your people. Please, Lord, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to learn what it is you would have us learn about the Passover meal and the fact that you have become our Passover offering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Israel is my first son, even my firstborn. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And today in Sabbath school, we were looking at the book of Colossians in chapter 1, and I was thinking, ah, there's where he says he's the firstborn of all creation. I think God wants us to understand the importance of the firstborn. Remember, the firstborn is the one who did who got the inheritance, right? You have the story of Esau and Jacob fighting over the inheritance. Who is the firstborn? And Jesus is Israel, God says, is my firstborn. Firstborn has been very important throughout history in almost every kind of culture. And I say unto thee, let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. There's a beautiful um, writing here on page 273, second paragraph of um, Patriarchs and Prophets. And I think this is an important thing to put into context because we want to reflect the character of God. God sounds so harsh if he's going to say, I'm going to slay my, your firstborn. But listen to this. The judgment of which Egypt had first been warned was to be the last visited. God is long-suffering and plenteous in mercy. He has a tender care for the beings formed in his image. And if the loss of their harvests and their flocks and herds had, been brought, had brought Egypt to repentance, the children would not have been smitten, would not have been, been killed, right? Amen. But the nation had stubbornly resisted the divine command, and now the final blow was about to fall. So God had done all those other things so that they would actually um, be able to um, realize that they needed to repent and let his people go. Isn't this a beautiful little picture? It shows up much better uh, on my computer than it does on the screen. But what a lovely little picture of a little lamb. A little, a little pet almost, time. Huh? And um, why would God let anything so cute and sweet as that be killed? Only that we might know how terrible sin is. Amen. Wages of sin is death. And having seen a little thing die, would you ever want to commit a sin so you had to bring a little lamb to the tabernacle again? Oh, my heart would be so sad. I would just say, oh, no, no, I don't want to sin. I don't want to tell that lie or I don't want to do those other things. This would be the way the Passover lamb would be prepared. He would be um, uh, cut at the neck in a kosher fashion. And we're going to just go ahead and read what the first Passover was commanded in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Oh, there's an interesting thing. Souls. Souls that are going to eat lamb. Hmm, they must be just living beings, huh? Souls are not things that just float around. These are people that can come to your house and eat uh, Passover with you. So interesting. The Bible interprets itself and lets you know that souls are living beings. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. <laughs> right. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the land. 
and your land shall be what? Without blemish. Without blemish. Without blemish. In other words, boys and girls that are here, there can't be anything on the land that's wrong. You can't have an eye that's blind or one little leg that's too short or some little shoulder that's crooked. It has to be without blemish. It has to be perfect. A perfect little land. And a male of the first year. Well, think about it. My son, so it's going to be a male. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. So that both of those are acceptable. And if did I go backwards? And you shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it in the evenings, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, no raw meat, no sodden at all with water, you can't just boil it in a pot, but roast it with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And I wondered, what's pertinence? So I, I looked up pertinence, and it's an animal's viscera, with, or internal organs, especially the heart, the liver, and the lungs. So he's just been put on the, on the grill, if you will, and he has been roasted in whole. So, and he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. So no leftovers for this meal. No leftovers. And that which remains of it, so if there was some leftovers until the morning, you shall what? Burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded. Well, what does that mean? That means you've got to have your drawers on. <laughs> you gotta have your you gotta be dressed, your shoes on your feet. You know, sometimes I think if the time of trouble comes on a Sabbath morning, some of us women some of, wearing some of these shoes would be in big trouble, wouldn't we? <laughs> but this one they have to have their shoes on their feet and their staff in your hand, which is like a walking stick. That's also a, a guide for your sheep. And you shall eat it in haste. So now whenever I eat my meal fast and I gobble down my food. Probably not a good idea. But this meal was not a leisurely meal. You shall eat it in haste. You've got to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. And here's the reason why. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn born in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. And I just want to say here, you know, sometimes we take this word gods of Egypt and we just think about those, those idols that were there and the, um, the different things. But do you know in every situation where there was a god, a false god, there was a demonic presence that was associated with that false god. These people weren't afraid of these things for no reason. Bad things did happen if they didn't do some of their little compliances and make their offerings and do these things. The demons managed to make their lives miserable. And so God is not saying this just about some kind of statues. He's talking about some of these fallen demons that have been attacking and been um, ruling and governing over the land of Egypt. So he's going to execute a judgment um, Against all the gods will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And there we get the word passover. I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And then he says this, and this shall be for you, unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it for shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Well, now, now I, that makes you almost wonder: Are we supposed to be going out and killing lambs, right? So that's why we had for our scripture reading this morning: The Lord is our Passover. This, this feast was supposed to be um, a commemorative. 
It was supposed to be something that you would remember annually, something that, that um, you wouldn't forget. It was also, uh, uh, what were you going to forget? You know, all the things about this plague when you smite the land of Egypt, uh, God's telling them to, to keep it annually. Um, and this verse here in Exodus 12, 26 and 27, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. So, not only is it commemorative, um, but it is also typical. In other words, these things have types that help us understand about God's salvation plan. And one of the things was it was supposed to be hyssop. And they look up, they can't really tell you what the plan is of hyssop, but they do know that it was something that it was sort of a bush-like thing that you could stick into blood and, and, and turn it into a brush. But hyssop was also used in purification with the, um, when they would make the ashes of the, of the red heifer. And then those ashes were used in the water to purify. We know that charcoal can be like that, can be purifying as well. Yeah, so hyssop his, is related to oregano. And hyssop, according to our brother, is related to oregano. Those kind of herby, bushy plants. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there was also no broken bone on this land. Remember, they weren't supposed to break any bone. And that is the completeness of the sacrifice of Christ. That is definitely a type of that. And then we also had the flesh was to be eaten, and it had to be consumed. And that's like us wanting to be continually spiritually strengthened by partaking in the, um, in the uh, word of Christ. You know, the, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And so when we take in the word, we take it in, we're taking in the character of Christ. Amen? Amen. Part two, another part of that, the bitter herbs, was contriteness for sin and deliverance from bondage. Oh, how wonderful it is to remember that we were not always converted. We were not always saved. Even as little children, we need to, need to make little marks in our life where this is when I decided to totally give my heart to the Lord Jesus. And to never want to hurt him, and never want to make him sad again. And so the bitter herbs are there for that remembrance. And then the unleavened bread. And I had a little trouble with this, but remember they, they were to put their, their dough in their trough, ready to go with them, and this bread that they made, they made in a hurry, because they were getting ready to leave that night. They were going to leave the land of bondage. And do you know us? I have a trouble because I have two houses. Am I ready to leave this planet? You know, I'm ready to sell the one up north, by the way. <laughs> but, but the urgency of the hour. This, is, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You know, my, my treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Amen? Amen. And when you think about this ur urgency of the hour, that this is the last, these are the last days. Our Lord Jesus is coming soon. And the unleavened bread speaks to us about the fact that they didn't take time for it to all bubble up and all rise up and then be baked. They just got it laying flat. And Judy's telling me it's like pie crust when it's when it's like that. You know, it's just a flat thing like they had for, for fellowship. Yes? It spoils faster, too. That's another reason. Uh, leavened bread or unleavened? Leavened. Yeah. Yes, leavened bread uh, spoils faster. These crackers... This, this, this matzo will last a really long time. And, um, yeah, I keep all my bread in the freezer or the refrigerator. But in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, we have a, a, a look at what happened before the foundation of the world. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the land slain from the foundation of the world. Well, if your name is written in the book of life, you're not going to worship the beast, but the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We have a picture of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And who was that? Jesus. The Lord Jesus. Amen. Christ, the Son of God. And 
And the Passover observance, I know this isn't very clear, but it was an easy fix for me. The lamb was without blemish. Jesus was examined and found without blemish. Uh, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. The lamb was a male of the first year. Jesus was the firstborn son of God. The lamb was set aside for four days on the 10th of Nisan. Jesus entered Jerusalem and the temple on public, on public display for four days on the 10th of Nisan. The penalty was imposed the moment the lamb was chosen. Christ received the death penalty for our sin before he was born. We just read that scripture, didn't we? The lamb was killed between the evening at 3 o'clock p.m. Jesus died in the seventh hour at 3 o'clock p.m. The lamb's bones were not broken, and Jesus' bones were not broken. Remember, they came to break his bones when he was on the cross. They were going to break his legs because they wanted the, the, the Sabbath was coming, and they wanted to, to in the Jewish nation, they wanted to take the, the, uh, the crosses down. And, you know, it was when they lifted up to breathe that they got a, a little break of relief. And if they broke their legs, they, uh, the persons on the cross could not lift themselves up to breathe and they would die very quickly. But when they came to break Jesus' legs, his legs, he had already said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So Jesus didn't ever have a broken bone. And he was our perfect example of what God has set up as this Passover as the Passover lamb. Also, at, when that lamb was supposed to be offered in the temple on the day that Jesus, because it was a daily offering also of a lamb, guess what? That lamb escaped. And that was the time when the, the, um, the curtain was torn from the top to the bottom. Not from the bottom to the top like a person could do it, like a man or a woman could do it, but from the top to the bottom. And that meant that it was a divine, supernatural Terry opening up of our pathway into the presence of God. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was dying on the cross at the same time as that little lamb was supposed to be sacrificed, he escaped because the new, the new sacrifice had come into being, which is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then another thing. The, um, blood of the, uh, the blood of the Lamb applied to the door saved the Israelites firstborn, and the blood of Christ saves us. The body of the Lamb must be eaten the same night. Jesus was crucified, suffered, and died in the same night. On Thursday night, he began his suffering when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he was tried in the middle of the night when it became Friday, and then he died all in that. And the evening and the morning is the first day. So Christ <coughs> suffered all in the same time. No work was to be done on the Passover. The Israelites could not save themselves. Even if they should have spent all the night in prayer, the destroying angel would have broken in upon them and slain their firstborn if the blood was not over the door. And the blood of Jesus saves us, not our works. Amen. Amen. So there is a commemorative annual remembering of the Passover, and then there's also a type which points us to the meaning of Passover for us today. This is the hyssop that was spread, dipped in the blood of that lamb that was cut from his throat, cut in a little bowl, and then spread over the door of the Israelites' homes. And here's a man that's, in, that's prepared to, to make sure that this death angel passes over, over his um, home. And here you have a family making sure that it's done right. And uh, Pastor John, if you'll read the part that I gave to you. At midnight, there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. All the firstborn in the land, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon. And all the firstborn of cattle had been smitten by the destroyer. Throughout the vast realm of Egypt, the pride of every household had been laid low. The shrieks and wails of the mourners filled the air. King and courtiers, with balanced faces, 
and trembling lids stood aghast at the overmastering horror. Pharaoh remembered how he had once exclaimed, Who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let the Israel go. Now his heaven-daring cry, humbled in the dust, he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go. Serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said. And be gone and bless me also. The royal counselors also and the people entreated the Israelites to depart out of the land in haste, for they said, we be all dead men. At midnight there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. In Patriarchs and Prophets on page 279, it says, by obedience, the people were to give evidence of their faith. So all who hope to be saved by the merits of the blood of Christ should realize that they themselves have something to do in securing their salvation. While it is Christ only that can redeem us from the penalty of transgression, we are to turn from sin to obedience. Amen. Man is to be saved by faith, not by works. Yet his faith must be shown by his works. God has given his son to die as a propitiation for sin. He has manifested the light of truth, the way of life. He has given facilities, ordinances, and privileges. And now man must cooperate with these saving agencies. He must appreciate and use the helps that God has provided. Believe and obey all the divine requirements. Praise the Lord. On page 278, this was actually before that what we just read, but it said, before obtaining freedom, the bondmen must show their faith in the great deliverance about to be accomplished. The token of blood must be placed upon their houses and they must separate themselves and their families from the Egyptians and gather within their own dwellings. And had the Israelites disregarded in any particular the directions given them, had they neglected to separate their children from the Egyptians, had they slain the lamb but failed to strike the doorpost with blood, or had any of them gone out of their houses they would not have been secure Amen. or saved or safe. Amen? They might have honestly believed that they had done all that was necessary, but their sincerity would not have saved them. All who failed to heed the Lord's directions would lose their firstborn by the hand of the destroyer. And there it was. What came to pass in Pharaoh's household, his firstborn son was slain. It was very sad, but over in the land of Goshen, in the land where the Israelites lived, where those who had put the blood over the doorpost and on the sides of the door, the death angel, when it came, it passed over. And inside would be the people eating the lamb, with the bread and the, um, the juice, and they would be there with the bitter herbs, with their shoes on their feet, with their staff in their hand, ready for the deliverance. They were believing by putting those shoes on and by being ready to go, they were believing that what God had said was going to come to pass. Amen? Amen. It was their faith that made them able to be to be part of this wonderful deliverance. It wasn't, but, and I think it was interesting where she said, but our faith is shown by our works. Yeah. We just read that. If they had neglected any part of that, it wouldn't have, it, they would not have been secure. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says, Christ is our Passover. Because 
Some people might say, well, now I've just got to go, I've got to go get me a lamb, I've got to go get all these things, and uh, I've got to figure out what day of the year it's exactly, and, and I've got to do this uh, just like Jesus, God said in the Old